looks like blood in there. And... It's not blood, it's deer meat. I had a big bag of, and there's a farm around here that does deer meat and hamburgers. A mother's love should endure all. No matter what happens, we believe they should be programmed to protect their children. They should go to any length to protect them from coming to harm on any level. But sometimes, something somewhere along the way goes terribly wrong. The instincts that seem to be innate are just missing. And that love turns to indifference and perhaps even to hate. However, trying to fully understand these mothers may be impossible for an outsider. This is an additional notice for viewer discretion. Holy f we got a body. Yeah. All right, let's. Viewer discretion is advised for this educational documentary. Welcome or welcome back to Dark Case Documentaries. I bring you true crime, disturbing stories and other things that you may later regret knowing with regular uploads every week. Please do join a quickly growing, incredibly supportive Dark Case family by hitting subscribe now and turning on notifications. Thank you so much to all of my patrons. If your name is on screen right now, then you're a legend. Our love and respect goes out to all those affected by today's dark case. Eli Hart was born to Ulyssa Taylor and Tori Hart in December of 2015. The two young parents didn't stay together for very long, and Eli didn't have the easy, carefree childhood that all children deserve to have. Young Eli had Towns Brock syndrome. This is a genetic disorder that is very rare. Less than 5,000 people have Towns Brock syndrome in the United States. This syndrome can be spotted by physicians because of some of its unique physical characteristics. These include misshapen thumbs and unusually shaped ears. Towns Brock syndrome can lead to several health challenges. These include hearing loss, intellectual disabilities, heart defects, and kidney issues. Not everyone with Towns Brock syndrome will display all of these symptoms. And in Eli's case, the condition caused hearing problems. This meant he would have to use hearing aids for the rest of his life. He also had kidney disease, which required medical monitoring. In addition to these medical issues, Eli didn't have the most stable home to live in. At the beginning of his life, Eli's father, Tori, was absent. He had fallen out of contact with Eli shortly after his birth. However, in 2019, Eli and Tori were brought back together. This was when Tori and Ulyssa both attended a family wedding. The exes exchanged phone numbers and, as a result of that meeting, Tori began having a relationship with his son once again. Both father and son found joy in the moments that they spent together. Finally, their relationship, their bond, began to grow. Tori would look forward to the next time he would get to see his son. He made it known that he missed Eli when he was with his mother. When Eli was with his dad, his wide, enthusiastic smile showed just how happy he was. Ulyssa, however, seemed to be intent on driving a wedge between Eli and Tori as they grew closer. Ulyssa made repeated statements about how Tori was a threat to her, even once saying that he had put explosives in her vehicle. However, no proof was ever found to support her stories. There were indications that Eli's mother wasn't properly taking care of him. Ulyssa herself struggled with breakdowns in her mental health. Eli was subsequently placed in foster care in January of 2021. This was because of concerns that his mother couldn't adequately care for him. This wasn't the first time that Child Protection Services had heard Ulyssa's name. In December of 2015, CPS officials had received its first tip about Ulyssa. It was said that she was using illicit substances while she was pregnant with Eli. And then, when Eli wasn't even two years old, another report about Ulyssa came in. This new report caused even more doubts about whether Ulyssa could give Eli the care that he needed. The mother agreed to seek out the help she needed for both herself and for Eli. Therefore, the case was closed at that time by officials. 
However, as he got older, Eli was removed from Ulysses' care. When he was placed in foster care in January of 2021 with Ulysses' cousin, a man named Stephen Cronberg and his wife Nikita, he remained in their care for almost a full year. Despite the troubles that he had already seen in his life, Eli was a kind boy. He was now in kindergarten and seemed to have a permanent smile. His infectious smile was adorable, in part because of the missing two front teeth he had as a result of losing his baby teeth. Like many young boys, Eli, who lived in Mound, Minnesota, enjoyed playing games of pretend, especially if there was a matchbox car involved. He someday hoped to have an exciting career as a firefighter. With his outgoing personality and positive attitude, he quickly and easily made friends with other kids of his age. He had a deep love of adventure and exploration. He had a curious mind and a playful nature. During his time in foster care, Eli's father was able to continue to nurture a relationship with him. Eli absolutely loved the time that he spent with his father. This was according to Nikita Kronberg, who was Eli's foster mother. Father Tory, who was now living in Chetuk, Wisconsin, had decided to attempt to get custody of Eli. This was instead of having him return to the care of Ulyssa. With his engagement to be married to a woman named Josie Josephson, Tory now felt he could provide a more stable home life and a better care for Eli than Ulyssa could. Eli now began to spend supervised as well as unsupervised time with Ulyssa. Whilst the full-time custody issues were being decided, people that were close to Eli said his temperament and behaviour began to change for the worse. Eli was now getting in trouble for acting out at school. He had started to show aggression towards other children, something he had never done before. In one instance, he had allegedly kicked a classmate in the throat. Another time, while playing, he was accused of pushing another child off of a slide. Statements that Eli made at school also painted a bleak picture of his home life with Ulyssa. Eli had told a teacher at school that his mum sometimes pushed him at home. This supplied another indication that something was severely amiss. A play therapist who was working with Eli reported that Ulyssa became argumentative with her. This caused Eli to run off and seek shelter in a nearby cupboard. Eli's sudden, unusual behaviour led Tori to state his worry, a deep worry that his son might be undergoing emotional or mental maltreatments from his mother. With Eli's behaviour changing so rapidly, it seemed as if there must be a reason for it. Because of this feared maltreatment, Tori was worried about Eli's safety when he returned to live with Ulyssa. And as it turns out, Tori wasn't the only one who feared what might happen to Eli if he were to permanently be returned to his mother. Eli's foster care providers had also expressed their concerns. In March of 2022, Tori sent an email to the social workers handling his son's case. In that email, he wrote about his fears that his son might be undergoing maltreatment from his mother. The email he sent detailed the reasons that he suspected this treatment. He told the social workers that Eli was displaying signs of anxiety, such as difficulty sleeping, using baby talk when he had previously outgrown it, and chewing on the fabric of his shirt. In addition, Eli had started stuttering once again, something he had previously gotten over. All of those issues had only developed once he had been moved back in with his mother. During supervised visits that Eli had with his mother, social services saw some odd behaviour from Ulyssa as well. On one occasion, she threw garbage at a staff member and dug her fingernails into the woman's hand. She would also ignore Eli's requests that she play with him during these visits. Instead, she would simply sit there, staring into the distance. Despite the concerns expressed to them, Eli's mother was given full custody of him once again on May the 10th, 2022. This was a very, very bad decision. In the late hours of May the 19th or the early morning of May the 20th, Eli's life sadly came to an end. Ulyssa aimed a firearm at Eli. She then pulled the trigger nine times. He was sat in the booster seats of Ulyssa's car. 
This car was then stopped by Orono police on May the 20th after they responded to calls about someone driving a vehicle with a missing tyre and a broken back windshield. When officers pulled over the vehicle, they made a horrific discovery. They spotted thick red fluid in the vehicle as well as on the mother. This is the real footage of that traffic stop. There is no tire there, alright. There's what? There's blood all over the car. Should I have a broken windshield and I'm missing a tire because some kids were shooting at my car? Well, it looks like blood in there. It's not blood, it's deer meat. I had a big bag of, and there's a farm around here that does deer meat and hamburgers. Ulyssa told police that kids with BB guns had shot out the back window of her vehicle. She explained the blood as having come from a deer. The police officers let her go back to a nearby apartment while they remained by her car. A short while later, police found Eli's body in the trunk of the car with a shotgun next to it. Yeah. Holy shit. We got a body. Yeah. All right, let's cover it. The death had happened mere days after his birth mother had finally regained custody of him. Eli's mother was arrested and charged with murder. However, she repeatedly denied killing her son. After the shooting had occurred, Eli's father lodged a lawsuit against Dakota County Social Services since they sent Eli back to Ulyssa even though there were indications her mental health was not stable, as well as information that she was allegedly using illicit substances. I can't even tell you how many times we expressed our concerns, our fears. Hart's fiancé says he recently filed for custody of Eli that was a little over a year after court records showed Dakota County took the boy into custody. Documents also show Thaler was hospitalized then and was hearing voices telling her to keep Herself. On May 10th, they returned custody and closed the county case in Dakota County. And 10 days later, we got the news that Eli was found dead. Other red flags mentioned in the lawsuit as to why she shouldn't have been awarded custody of Eli included how she was trying to sabotage Eli's relationship with his father and that she didn't even have a stable housing situation. She also hadn't completed a parenting education program. This was simply because she hadn't shown up to enough of the classes. Tory's custody lawsuit will be heard in federal court sometime in 2024. Now Eli's father is suing Dakota County and three workers claiming that they are responsible for Eli's death by failing to protect him from Julissa Thaler despite countless red flags. Lou Raguse has been pouring through the complaint filed this afternoon and joins us now with more. Lou? Randy and Julie, many of those red flags are laid out in heartbreaking detail in this civil complaint, which documents that Dakota County officials knew of these dangers, were warned about them further by Eli's father, Tory Hart, and by Thaler's own father, and that county officials continued with their goal to keep Eli and his mother together. Julissa Thaler accused of shooting her six-year-old son, Eli Hart, multiple times at close range while strapped into a booster seat in her car, was given custody 10 days earlier by a judge at the recommendation of Dakota County Social Services. A wrongful death lawsuit filed by Eli's father, Tory Hart, against Dakota County lays out dozens of disturbing incidents involving Thaler's care that those officials knew about. But before that happened, Ulyssa's criminal charges had to be addressed. Julissa Thaler, the mother accused of killing her son, Eli Hart, has again turned down an offer to plead guilty to second-degree murder. Instead, she will go to trial for first-degree murder. Prosecutors say her... After being charged with the crime, Ulyssa turned down a plea bargain and instead opted for a jury trial. During Ulyssa's murder trial, her ex-boyfriend, Robert picker provided key testimony about the nights that young Eli died. He was able to fill in some of the blanks about just what had happened. These images from 11.22 p.m. on May 19, 2022 are the last showing six-year-old Eli Hart alive. In heartbreaking testimony today, Robert Pickerainen filled in gaps for the jury about what happened leading up to those images and what happened when Eli's mother, Julissa Thaler, returned to the apartment the next morning. Initially, Roberts was also arrested in connection with Eli's death. 
but his name was fully cleared and he was released without any charges. According to Robert, he and Ulyssa were acquaintances in high school and they subsequently met up again in 2022. They sometimes took illicit substances together. Court records confirmed Ulyssa's long history with illicit substances. This included the information that she was just 13 when she began drinking. By age 16, she was allegedly misusing opiates and she was misusing sedatives by age 20. For these substance issues, she had been hospitalised more than once and had been sent to get treatment. At age 21, medical records show she was on LSD every day. This alleged substance use would remain an issue for her right up until the arrest for Eli's passing. During his court testimony, Robert said on May 19th, 2022, which would be the last day of Eli's life, he and Ulyssa picked up Eli from school. Eli's last night was spent eating pizza and playing with kittens. However, things took a sinister turn. Ulyssa felt that Eli was getting too rowdy. The mother then began striking him and Eli responded by striking her back. Robert said that following this incident, Ulyssa placed her shotgun in the car and then went back to the house. Robert, who was lying in Ulyssa's bed at that time, said she then got Eli and went downstairs with him. When Robert woke up the next day, he asked Ulyssa where she went the night before. She responded that she had something to do. He noted that Eli wasn't home at the time and he had assumed that the child was simply at school. However, after police discovered Eli's body, they arrested Ulyssa along with Robert, although he had no idea what was going on. He also told the court that he had been with Ulyssa when she bought the shotgun and went with her when she worked on her shooting skills at a gun range. According to Robert, his partner had mentioned more than once that she wanted the shotgun for her own protection. He said that he never imagined she would use it on her own son. Robert's testimony proved to be very convincing, especially when other evidence backed up his story. The jury also heard from a DNA expert who said that Eli's blood was a match for the DNA in the blood found on Ulyssa's hair by police on May the 20th. In addition, the prosecution argued that the crime was premeditated, and they backed up this claim by stating that Ulyssa had conducted internet searches based around life insurance policies before the murder occurred. Said leading up to the murder, Thaler had researched life insurance policies for Eli, searched Google for, quote, how much blood can a six-year-old lose, and also purchased ammunition that she wanted to, quote, blow the biggest hole into something as proof the slang was premeditated. Thaller's defense counted that the 28-year-old would not, could not, and did not kill her son, urging the jury to keep an open mind, assume nothing, and withhold judgment until it's time to deliberate. During the sentencing hearing, both Josie, who was a woman engaged to Tori, and Nikita, Eli's foster mother, spoke about what a delightful boy Eli was. During Ulyssa's trial, her attorney Brian Leary alleged that her client wasn't the one who had shot Eli, although she did admit to taking part in her son's demise. However, the jury didn't buy that explanation. They subsequently found her guilty of her son's murder. When the judge gave Ulyssa the opportunity to make a few remarks during her sentencing, she simply chose to use an obscenity and insult the judge by calling him garbage rather than to show any remorse or to admit her guilt. Mr. Stoller, you have a right to speak this morning if you'd like. You don't have any obligation to speak, but if you'd like to choose to speak, now is the time to do it. Yes, I would like to say something. Go ahead. Um, I'm innocent. You all, you're garbage. That's all you're on. Miss Stoller, don't know that that's appropriate here. Um, Sorry, I told you what somebody else can. Bottom line is that you are being sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole in a star. Ulyssa Tala was sentenced to life in prison in February of 2023 without the possibility of parole. Your Honor, everyone knows Eli Hart as the victim of this senseless and horrific crime. But Eli was so much more. Eli was an amazing six-year-old boy who always woke up full of energy and laughter. He was kind, made friends easily, loved reading books. 
Eli had a love for animals that was very special. Eli explored, played outside, fished with his dad. Eli was an innocent, loving six-year-old boy. He did not deserve this. Eli deserved to grow up and have a safe and happy life. We know these things about Eli because he was our little boy, our son, the center of our world. The little boy who would tell me not to be scared of bees, that they were nice and we need them. The little boy that loved being on his dad's shoulders. The little boy who, when we asked him, who loves you the most, would always reply, you both do. There are no more triple hugs. No more I love you. No more memories to be made. Just emptiness. Eli was a happy six-year-old boy, our little boy, that we loved so deeply. Do you think the punishment fits the crime here? What do you think could be done to avoid something like this happening again in the future? Please do let me know down in the comments. Be careful out there and I'll see you soon.